Hi, a very good evening, everyone. Let us introduce ourselves. I'm Chelsea. And I'm Jawan. We will be your MCs for today. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank you so much for joining our third and last event of the MedLife campaign, Let's Talk Medical School Admissions Test, organized by TLPMC. I'm sure that this talk will be informative and useful to all the future medics out there. Today, we are joined by Nicholas and Hamony, who are the former EXCO POD members of the TLPNC. They will share their experience and provide helpful tips on this admission test. So do look forward to and stay tuned for the event. This will be followed by a short Q&A session in which our viewers at home will have a chance to ask our guest speakers some questions. The Slido link for the Q&A will be provided in the chat box by one of our Expo BOD members. So please keep the questions coming. And you can also upvote any question that you find relevant or interesting. Before we, be we begin, there will be some housekeeping rules that participants should adhere to. Participants should turn, on mic turn off microphones at all times to ensure no disruption. Participants should also be mindful of their tone and language use when asking questions. And when asking a question, be specific as to whom you want the question to be answered by. Lastly, all questions should be kept for the Q&A session. And if any of the rules stated above are not adhered to, the committee will not hesitate to remove you from this event. That's all for housekeeping rules. Last but not least, we'll be having a photo session with everyone at the end, so don't forget to get camera ready beforehand. Without further ado, I will pass the floor to Hemony, who will be talking about the UCAT. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, okay, so I will begin. I'm sorry, one second. Okay. Um, so hello. Um, so today I will be talking to you about the UCAT examination. Uh, before we jump right into it, I will start off with a bit about myself, as you might be thinking, who am I to give a talk about the UCAT? So I'm Hengini and I was part of the August 2020 SACE intake and I just finished my final exams about three, year, three weeks ago. Uh, for context, I applied to both the UK and Australia to do medicine. So I had to sit for the UCAT and the ISAT, which Nick will talk about later. Uh, today, I will be sharing some information about the UCAT with you and some tips I have. Um, obviously, do take everything with a pinch of salt as I'm simply sharing things that have worked with me. Uh, worked for me and I myself have not even gotten into medical school yet so I'm not a pro or anything of that sort um, and just for your information I will be sharing the slides um, with all participants so you can all access the resources anyway let's get into it okay so what is the UCAT so the UCAT stands for the University Clinical Aptitude Test it's usually one of the three main criteria used by universities in Australia New Zealand and the UK for courses such as medicine and dentistry. Um, the other two things on the criteria um, is usually um, an interview or academics. Um, the UCAT is basically like a standardized test um, that has a goal of assessing qualities considered to be desirable in the health profession. So things like empathy, abstract reasoning and problem solving. Okay, so who uses the UCAT? Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Australian, um, British and universities in New Zealand use the UCAT. So I've listed a few, uh, I've listed all the ANZ and UK universities and just for your information, I obtained this from the UCAT website. So you can always refer to it that. Um, it is important to note that not all universities require the UCAT for medicine and dentistry. Um, with regard to the UK, it's quite standard. Either the university requires the UCAT or the BMAP. So if they require the UCAT, then all students must take the UCAT, whether you're international or local, as in British. Um, however, with Australia, it is a bit different. Um, some universities accept um, international students taking either the UCAT ANZ or the ISAT, which is another test, um, while others prefer um, international students just doing the ISAT or just doing the UCAT ANZ. So you can't really choose. Um, 
So for example, the UNSW accepts both the ISAT and the UCAT. Meanwhile, the University of Adelaide only accepts the UCAT. So it's better to just check with the university directly um, on their website um, to make sure you do the right test. So you might be wondering if the UCAT um, used um, or ANZ and the UK are the same. To answer your question, um, virtually they are the same in regard to structure and questions. Um, the only difference is that for the SJT section, which is the last section I'll be talking about later, um, the UK UCAT gives you um, a band instead of a score like the UK ANZ. Um, I will get into this a bit later on anyway. Um, that being said, the UK UCAT is not accepted by Australian universities. Meanwhile, um, the UCAT ANZ is accepted by British universities. Why is that the case? I don't know. Um, it's just like that. Um, so you just have to bear with it. Um, and you also can't sit for the UCAT ANZ and the UK UCAT in the same year. Again, I don't know why, but it's just how it is. So my advice is if you're like me and you want to apply to the UCAT schools in Australia and, and the UK, then sit for the UCAT ANZ. And note that you will have to fill up a special form um, to ensure that your UCAT ANZ results get sent to the UK universities. But if you're planning to just apply to the UK or just Australia, then I recommend just sitting for the, the, the respective UCAT. So you can sign up using the links I've listed below. Um, again, I will be sharing this so you can just click on it. Um, I do want to mention that you can't sit for the exams anytime you want. There are specific testing cycles each year, and these testing cycles may differ between the UK and ANZ. So as of now, you need to wait till next year to register for the 2022 test cycle. Um, I'm not entirely sure when it is, so just keep looking at the website um, to uh, sign up in time. Okay, so the UCAT structure. As I mentioned before, the UK UCAT and the UCAT um, ANZ are the same uh, in terms of structure. So the rest of my presentation will apply to um, you, um, you no matter what um, UCAT you're sitting for. So the UCAT is a two hour computer-based test and all the questions are multiple choice. And there are five main sections, verbal reasoning, decision-making, quantitative reasoning, abstract reasoning, and situational judgment. Um, and you can see the number of questions and uh, the time given for each section. So now I'll go into each section. So verbal reasoning is the first section. This is usually the section people, including myself, find the hardest. So it takes a lot of practice to master it. I have to admit, my, I myself did not do that great in this section. So I will be just going over the structure and some general tips. So what does VR encompass? Essentially, it's like reading comprehension. You'll get a question, you get a passage and um, you have to answer some questions about it. Specifically, you get 11 passages and each passage has about four questions. So in total, you have 21 minutes to answer 44 questions. The general advice is to spend about two minutes per passage, which gives you about 30 seconds per question. And I realize this is not a lot of time at all. So there are two main types of questions. Uh, the first one is true, false, and can't tell. Here you'll be provided with a statement and you have to see if the statement is true, false, or you can't tell if it's either um, based on the information provided. Essentially, the in, this, if the statement is true, then the statement must directly match the information in the text. Um, if the statement is false, then it must, um, the statement should directly contradict the text. And finally, if it's can't tell, you quite literally, it quite literally means that you don't know um, if the statement is correct or false uh, because the text doesn't mention anything about it. However, you should not jump to this conclusion so quickly as you might be tempted to if you just don't know um, what answer to pick. Next, there will also be reading comprehension type questions. Here you will be provided with an incomplete statement or a question and you'll be required to pick one of the four options that, best, that can best be concluded based on the passage. So here's an example question. Um, due to time constraints, I will not be going over um, how you approach the question, but I will be um, sharing the slides and I will add the answer there so you can just do it at your own time. So this is another example question. Okay, so general tips, at least what worked for me. So I recommend you practice your speed reading because you only have about 
two minutes per um, passage. And in, that two, in those two minutes, you have to answer all the questions. So you might want to try and practice grasping information quickly. And you can do this by just reading, reading newspapers and magazine articles. At least that's what I did. Um, I, what I did was I skimmed through the passage, then I answered the question. I know many people um, recommend doing the other thing, um, reading the questions, then um, skimming through the passage. But I found that it was easier to look at the passage first, because if you want to look through the question, and you have to click um, on the next, on the button that says next, and that can be quite time consuming. Um, so I just did reading first, then answering the questions. But um, if that doesn't work for you, then um, don't worry, you can read the questions first. And when you read, you should look out for keywords as that can help you understand the text better. Also look out for words such as many, never, always, some, and only. These words are called qualifiers and they tend to use it to try and confuse you. So you might wanna look out for those things. Also refrain from answering questions based on your own knowledge because sometimes the text given can be of familiar context and you might be tempted to answer the questions based on your own knowledge, um, but, you um, but you shouldn't as you should only look at the uh, passage for the information. And this applies for all the rest of the section. So if you get stuck, um, you can either flag the question or just guess the question, because I think it's better to just um, guess it if you're really stuck on it or if you don't have time, then leave it blank because at least you have like a one out of four chance of getting it right instead of a zero. Okay, so here are some resources. Um, I won't be going through it again, but um, you can refer to it at any point. So decision-making is the second section. The aim of DM is to assess um, your ability to make decisions quickly based on whatever information is given. So here you've got 29 questions um, to answer in 31 minutes. This means you have just over a minute per question. Um, for decision-making, um, there are six types of questions. Uh, yeah, so here are all the questions. Um, you can refer to it later. Um, I think the description really um, explain it, explains it quite clearly. So here's an example question I will be skipping over for now. Okay, general tips. Um, so I think you should read the information provided really carefully before tackling the question, as the information provided um, can be quite tricky sometimes, so you want to take time to un like really understand it before going to the questions. You will also be given a whiteboard um, at your UCAT exam, so I think make the most out of your whiteboard and create your own Venn diagrams um, or like scribble down all the information to help you understand it better and help you visualize it a bit better if you really have to. And I use the whiteboard a lot. Um, use a calculator when necessary. There is a calculator that will be given to you. And I will go over about the calculator um, for the other section where it's used more. Um, but yeah, you can use it uh, when necessary. Um, again, do not panic, just flag or guess when you're not too sure. And also take the information given quite literally. Try not to overthink so much and try to have like a bird's eye view of the problem as it kind of helps you um, attempt the question better. And for DM, I recommend you go over simple probability um, because there can be quite a few probability questions. Uh, I've already put um, like a few examples of like the basic probability so you can look at that. Um, in your own time. So again, the resources. Okay, so next up we have quantitative reasoning. This is basically the math section. Um, you, are, you are given a calculator, but I don't recommend you using it uh, for really easy sums that you can probably do in your head um, because this section is really heavily under time pressure and you only have 24 minutes to answer 36 questions. So I would recommend just brushing up on your general mental math. So here there are five types of five main types of calculations you will be required to make. Um, firstly, there are percentages. You will need to know how to convert decimals or fractions into percentages and vice versa. You might also need to know how to calculate percentage increase, decrease, and changes. Then there's proportionality and ratios. Here you will need to predict what happens to a certain value when something is increased or decreased. For example, if B is directly proportional to A, then if B doubles, A would also double. So things like that. Then we also have rates. Um, this refers to just calculating speeds and rates. 
I think it's just nice to remember that speed equals distance over time and apply this to the question type um, or like the context of the question. Then we have averages. You might need to um, calculate the mean, median or mode based on the information given. Um, like the simple kind of calculations, not the really advanced ones. Um, so brush up on like your maths lingo as it will help you um, easily detect what you need to calculate. And lastly, you've got geometry. You might be required to calculate the areas and volumes of basic shapes. Um, it is highly unlikely that they'll ask you to calculate the volume of a pyramid or an odd shape like that, but it is possible for them to ask you to calculate the surface area of a cube or the volume of a cuboid. Um, and they may ask you to calculate the area of a circle. So just remember how to do that and the equations for it. Overall, the maths expected is not of a very high level. It is similar to the maths you learned in year seven and eight, which, is, which would be form one and two. And even then it's the really basic ones, like I mentioned. Uh, they're probably not gonna ask you to differentiate or integrate some complex equations. So you don't need to worry about that. So about the calculator, um, unfortunately, you will not be given, uh, nor will you be able to bring in your own calculator. But there will be an on-screen calculator that will be available to you at all times. So you can use your key. So you need to use your keyboard to utilize the calculator. Um, here are some instructions on how to use the calculator and some tips as well. So you can just refer to it um, in your own time. And I and I recommend practicing questions with the on-screen calculator as it really helps you fully understand how it works. So here's a question I'll um, skip for now. Okay, so general tips. Um, I ended up doing quite well in this section despite not being good at it at all when I first started practicing. And I think it's because of these few reasons. So I think I did a lot of mental maths practice. I tried to do easy sums like five plus five or three times five, things like that that you can do in your head Try not to use the calculator when um, you do those kind of sums. Also, um, don't be afraid to use your calculator, that being said, uh, because for things like percentages, like calculating percentages, it might be just easier to calculate using the calculator instead of um, doing the working manually. Um, use your whiteboard, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, familiarize yourself with the calculator. Um, it is available on the official UCAP website um, if you want to do practice questions on that website, but you can use it then. Um, and also, if you have access to a keyboard with a number pad, I recommend using the calculator uh, or practice using the calculator using that number pad um, because during the exam you have the number pad and it would make it um, easier because you kind of know how it works. Um, I also recommend going over unit conversions, which I will share with you on the next slide, um, because you might be required to calculate uh, or like convert km to meters or to cm and things like that. And just again, do as many practice questions as you can. Um, yeah, do as many practice questions as you can, because after a while, you will be able to calculate things really quickly, and you will also be able to figure out what is expected from each question quite quickly. So here are the unit, uh, unit conversion that you can look at whenever you want. Okay, so the second last section is abstract reasoning. Here you have the least amount of time for the most number of questions. I know it sounds quite insane, but trust me, it all comes down to practice. When I first started practicing, this is by far my worst section. I used to get very few questions correct. However, I practiced a lot and ended up doing um, the best in this section. I placed in the top um, decile for this section. Um, so AR assesses your nonverbal reasoning. It checks to see if you're able to detect patterns and trends easily. So one way of approaching it um, is the scans method um, because you will be given like um, these patterns and keeping the scans method in, in, in the back of your mind kind of helps you um, detect the patterns or the trends quite easily. Um, so here's the question, and because abstract re reasoning is quite difficult um, to kind of un like detect the pattern sometimes, I have explained how the, um, why the answer is the answer in the slide, so you can refer to my explanation. Um, yeah, so here are some general tips. I think for abstract reasoning to really um, do well, I think you just have to practice a lot. Just do as many questions as you can. Um, 
because it helps you detect the patterns more easily. You, you recognize the patterns way more easily. Um, also, try not to overthink and try to look at the big picture first because you don't want to look at each individual um, pattern. Like in this one, there are six uh, boxes per set. You don't want to analyze the one box. You should look at the all six boxes at once to kind of get an idea. And remember, if you don't see the pattern at first, just flag it and come back to it. Also remember um, what numbers are prime, square, even, and odd, because it, it can help you. Um, uh, it can be a pattern in itself. And when first starting, I think it's important to just try and find the patterns and do the questions in your own time. Um, and then when it comes closer to the exam, do it under time pressure. Again, the resources. Okay. So SJT is the last section. As I mentioned earlier, in the UK UCAT, you are given a band instead of a score. The band goes from one to four, with one being the best and four being the worst. Whereas in UCAT A and Z, you're given a score for this section, just like all the other sections. So SJT, um, sorry, okay. So there are three main types of questions. Um, you may be given a scenario and a number of considerations. And you might have to rate the importance of each consideration from most to least important. Next there's appropriateness. Here you will be presented with a scenario and a series of actions. And you will need to rate the appropriateness of each action from very appropriate to least, um, to least uh, sorry, to very inappropriate. And lastly, there's most and least appropriate. Uh, you will be given a scenario and a few considerations and you must pick the most and least appropriate action to carry out in that situation. I forgot to mention that um, SJT basically evaluates the candidate's um, professionalism um, and assesses attributes that are considered important um, in the study and practice of medicine. So things like empathy and resilience, teamwork and integrity. So where to start? I would recommend reading this GMC booklet. It goes over what is expected um, from a med medical practitioner and it also familiarizes you with the basics of ethics and patient care. Here's an example question, a few example questions. Um, so in general tips, um, again, practice questions. Oh. Yeah, just practice the questions and read the reasons for the correct answer because on the UCAT website, when you practice, they'll give you um, the reason for the correct answer. So it's important, I think it's helpful to just read their reasons for the correct answer to really understand the ethics well. Um, and again, read through the guide I shared earlier. Um, and try not to think about what you would do in that situation because you might react differently to a doctor. Um, try and put yourself in the shoes of a doctor because um, doctors have different responsibilities to us. So you wanna think like them instead of yourself. And here are more resources. So because I'm running out of time, I will quickly go over what I wish I had done. Um, so obviously I wish I started prepping earlier um, about two months before. So I recommend you doing it about two months before. I only had about two weeks to do it because it was quite a last, about three weeks to do it because it was quite a last minute decision to do it in the first place. So I recommend doing about two minutes, before, two months before. I think I also spent a bit too long on, such, on sections I thought I was bad at and left out the ones I thought I was okay at, which left me doing better in the sections I thought I was bad at. So for example, abstract reasoning, I did lots of practice on that and did well on that. Whereas for verbal reasoning, I kind of did the same um, as I did when I first started. I didn't really do much practice, so I don't think I improved that much. I wish I did more practice. I also wish I read and researched a bit more about each section to kind of get a under uh, better understanding of what to expect on the day. And if you have access to an external keyboard and mouse, I think you should use that because it really mimics the uh, exam conditions. And uh, I think it helps you uh, experience the exam condition so you're not surprised on the day. And I also wish I had done a practice mock exam. Uh, I don't think I did any practice mock exams, so I didn't know how um, like uh, tiring it can be to do all five sections at once um, in two hours. So I do recommend doing at least one to get a better idea. So here are some re useful resources. Um, because I was quite desperate, I, I purchased Medify two weeks before the exam, um, you do have to purchase it. So I highly recommend it if you are willing to spend a bit of money. But I mean, if you start early, I think um, just using the U the free UCAT, sorry, 
just using the free UCAT question bank and practice tests online uh, should be um, sufficient. Uh, yeah, and here are some more useful resources that you can uh, look at. Uh, yeah, oh, so before I end, I just like to mention that don't get too bummed out if you don't do too well and don't stress yourself out to the extent that you can't handle a workload because it is only one of the three things that the universities are looking out for. So you can try and redeem yourself in those other aspects if you don't do so well in the UK or the admissions test. Um, but that being said, obviously do not practice as that won't benefit you either. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I have to share and I will pass it on to Nick to do the BMAT. Thank you, Heimini. That was indeed informative and I will definitely keep in mind the useful tips and advice you have provided. Next up, I would like to invite Nicholas to talk about the BMAT. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, all right, can uh, the screen be seen? Yes. Okay, I guess, yes. Okay, so hi everyone. I will walk you through the BMAT, which is kind of the other relevant uh, admissions test for medicine. Compared to the UCAT, I would say it's much more academically focused. Uh, and I guess a common question would be, why do some accept the BMAT, whereas other unis accept the UCAT? Um, and BMAT unis tend to be a lot more research focused and uh, kind of go in depth into the academic side of medicine a lot more. Um, but that's just for your curiosity. Just a quick disclaimer that everything I'm telling you is accurate as of today. And I'll give you a really general overview because I would rather you check with official resources. Uh, they'll be more up to date and you can find a lot more detail there. Uh, so just bear that in mind. I'll go through four sections. I'll introduce myself and the test. I'll go through the sections in the BMAT. I'll talk about the scoring, which can be a bit complicated, but uh, hopefully I'll kind of uh, clarify it. Uh, and then provide you with general advice for the test. Um, so yeah, just quick introduction. I'm Nick. I also did the SACE program uh, and I did the BMAT this month. Uh, I got my results yesterday. And I'm also applying to medicine both in Australia and the UK. Okay, so uh, I'll run you through the BMAT now and a quick introduction of the test. So it is an admissions test and it gauges the abilities of applicants. Uh, it is a non-calculator test as well, so I thought that would be important to add for you. It does help universities decide between high caliber candidates because obviously when you're applying to medicine, they always say that everyone will have, you know, 10 A-stars at GCSE and like four A-stars at A-level or something. Um, and it's kind of true, I guess. So it kind of helps universities distinguish even further between like the top scoring candidates um, overall. Just to give you context, uh, last year, 551 international students applied to Oxford for medicine and six got a place. Uh, so that's an acceptance rate of like 1% or for every applicant, there were 92 others who were rejected. Uh, so it's extremely competitive. And this is one of the ways that Oxford in this example would have actually did kind of chosen between all 551 students to give six a place. Uh, it is used alongside other factors, namely, you know, your personal statement, your predicted grades, uh, any any achieved grades like your SPM or your GCSE, um, and so on. So, yeah, it's administered by CAAT, Cambridge Assessment Admissions Testing. So they are the official kind of resource that you should refer to um, if you're interested. All right, so again, do check CAAT's website for updates on who uses the BMAT. Um, different universities also accept different testing dates, so it, it can be a bit uh, confusing. Um, and as I pointed out just now, it tends to be for research intense medical courses. So here's the list of unis. Uh, I, I showed you the UK ones because I would presume most of you are interested in UK medicine. Um, so uh, British universities accept the November sitting, at least that was for this year. And you'll see the universities here like Cambridge, Oxford, uh, Imperial, UCL, a lot more into research than 
other universities uh, that teach medicine in the UK. So uh, yeah, this is the official list for this year. It shouldn't change for next year, but um, no guarantees. So just check the website. Okay, so um, three sections, I'll go through each one and the kinds of things that you should expect uh, from each. So your first section is your thinking skills question. That's the name of it. Um, and it consists of mathsy and wordy questions. I think of it a bit like an IQ test uh, that lasts for an hour. You have 32 questions and an hour to do your first section. And it's about two minutes per question if you kind of work that out yourself. Um, so that, that would be important for you to bear in mind when you do practice, um, two minutes per question. So let me just show you, this is an example of one of the more math kind of questions that you would get. Um, you will have a paper and pen, um, but no calculator to do this. So there you go. Uh, I mean, I wish we had time to kind of let you try this out, but we don't. Uh, so I'll just show you the answer and you can work it out in your own time. And here's an example of a more worded question. Um, so again, here's the answer. Now for section two, this is your scientific knowledge and application section. It tests IGCSE or SPM level knowledge around that age. Uh, so you will get biology, chemistry, physics, and maths questions. Um, so you don't have to worry about your other uh, GCSE subjects, just focus on those. It's 30 minutes and you have about 30 questions. Um, for us, it was 27. So you will have about a minute per question. And the difficulty usually is with the timing because it's IGCSE knowledge. Like you at the point of, you know, sitting the exam should be well into your A-level or your say syllabuses. So, you know, GCSE level is nothing, but you have a minute per question. And these questions in an IGCSE paper might take you about five minutes to do. Um, so you have like a fifth of the time. Um, and that's what makes it tough. So here's an example of a bio question. It's pretty long. Uh, chemistry question takes a lot of calculating um, to do for like just a minute. Physics question. And then here's an example of a maths question. Again, no calculator, but you will get paper and, and pen. Oh, well, you have to bring your own pen, but no matter. Uh, okay, so. The last section, section three, is your writing task. They weren't very creative with the naming, but it does the job. Uh, you write an essay uh, from a, an option of three. So you'll get three questions, you kind of write an essay on one of them. Depending on whether you do the physical exam on paper, or if you do it online as a computerized test, you will have either an A4 sheet or a maximum of 550 words. Uh, so that's your limit. It's 30 minutes to write your essay, which is actually quite long. Um, at, at least I found that it was a good amount of time compared to at least section two. Uh, section one was okay. You are advised to spend about five to 10 minutes planning and then use the rest of that time to obviously write. Um, so, you know, do plan it thoroughly, make sure you're getting the best points uh, that you can think of and then expanding them as well as possible. So here's an example of the kinds of questions you'll get. You will see if you do enough past paper questions that they follow a trend. The first one is like a philosoph uh, philosophy question, nothing to do with science or medicine, um, but you know, it gets you thinking. The second one is more of like science in general. So not specific to medicine, but still related to science. And then the third one will be quite medical focused. Um, there have been examples of more veterinary related questions or dentistry related questions, but very rarely, it tends to be philosophy, science and medicine. And then you choose one, you write your answer. Uh, this is also what your answer sheets will look like. So if you do the computer test, which in like my case was um, online, then you'll see this here. Uh, and then your word count. So you have 550 words if you do it typing. And then if you do the physical test, you will get this piece of paper, oh, this piece of paper, and you have to write within this page. If you 
mess up and you need another paper, you're not going to get it. If you need to squash your writing, you know, that's what you have to do. You cannot write outside of that box, as it says there, you, your answer must contained, must be contained within this area. And you, again, you can ask for another sheet. So really plan it out. It's kind of worse if you do it physically. Okay, so the important thing, I guess, with the test like this would be the result. So I'll talk about how it's scored. It's a bit confusing for the BMAT. Uh, what's generally good and then what happens going forward from there. So for sections one and two, you will get a normalized score from one to nine, uh, to one decimal place. And it's based on the raw number of marks you achieved. So if you get like 27 out of 27, then you get this mark and so on. Um, it, it's, I mean, unlike other tests like the UCAT or the ISAT um, that I'll talk about as well, um, those take into account the difficulty of a question. In the BMAT, that's not the case. So an average score is around a four to five. Uh, usually a high four is considered average, but it depends on the year. Uh, a good score would be anything close to or above a six. And then an exceptional score is anything close to or above a seven. This is according to Cambridge's official website on the scoring. Of course, it depends on, on your universities of choice, what's considered good. Um, but this is just as a general guideline for you. Um, now for section three, it's different. So you get two scores. Firstly, you'll get a content score from one to five. Um, and just for your curiosity, I suppose, you can only either get a whole number or a number 0.5. So like you can get five, 4.5, four, and then so on. Uh, two people will mark your essay. So it's taken as the average of those. You will also get a language score given from E to A, um, and you can convert that to a number with A being five, uh, and then you know B being two, uh, four, and then so on and so forth. That will be important for something I will show you later on, known as the Oxford percentage. Um, yeah. Okay, so to put that into perspective for you, because uh, that, it, 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 yeah, it's a bit confusing. A full kind of like maximum score that you can get is a 995A. That is the highest score that you could get in the BMAT. An example of an average score based on past year data and um, kind of what is on the website would be around like a 4.6, 4.8, So that's like an average score. And then an exceptional score would be something like 7.3, 7.14A. Um, again, that's based on past year data and the official website. Uh, very rarely will people get something like that. Just as a guide for you, this is not official, um, but for you to keep in mind, if you're looking for Bryson and Sussex, Leeds, Lancaster, Kiel, aim for around a, the, the average score, basically. It will be good enough to get you in, um, as long as you do well in the interviews and stuff like that. Um, but this is what you should be aiming for. If you're looking at UCL and Imperial College, uh, then around a high five, and a three will be sufficient for you. Um, and then if you're looking at Oxford, Cambridge, then something around the sixes or higher would be good. Okay. Um, again, do check their websites. They give a lot of detail into what they're looking for and how they use your BMAT score. So just check with them. I mean, again, this is what I've compiled based on what they provide, but it's obviously not very detailed. Um, it's just as a reference for you. Okay, so this is what the official scorecard will look like, um, just for your curiosity, I suppose. Um, so you'll see the three sections and then the scores like that. And then just to show you how the distributions work. So this is for section one you'll see here. And this is for 2021. And then on the right is for 2020. Uh, so you'll see how different years have very different graphs um, based on the normalizing. I mean, I, I don't know how it really works behind the scenes, um, but generally you'll see this bell curved shape and yeah, getting anything like a, a six or above, you, you'll see 
that it's a tiny proportion of people who get that. Uh, and then this is just to show you how different years can have really different scores. Uh, so the curves look pretty different for both years. Uh, just bear that in mind. Okay, uh, I won't go through this in detail. Again, you can check uh, the different universities' websites for how they use it. But generally, you'll see things like cutoffs, rankings, and groupings. Um, so these are the different ways that universities might use your BMAT score. Um, I, I mean, the, sh the slides will be shared with you later, so you can look through it yourself. Um, and I won't go through it now, um, but it's there for you to see later on. The Oxford percentage is also something I won't go through because I know not everyone will be applying to Oxford, but they have some kind of formula uh, that they use to actually decide who gets an interview or not. And it's a fairly complicated formula, I guess. Um, so last year, this was the average score. Um, again, for your reference. Yeah. Okay, so how can you do well on the BMAT, I suppose, would be the most important section. All right, just in general, start early. The BMAT is a very academic test. It's almost like a GCSE paper. Um, it's, it's, yeah, something that you can study for and do start as early as possible because you'll get used to the style. Use practice sites like BMAT Ninja was my favorite website. I used it all the time. And try out the computer sample if you're doing the online test. If you do the paper test, try the paper test, like try doing it on a piece of paper and using the actual uh, scoring sheet because you have to get used to using that. Okay, but BMAT Ninja was my favorite website. It's free. You get a bunch of questions, like thousands of questions there. Um, they don't explain questions, which is an issue with the BMAT. Resources are really hard to find and they do it on purpose. So don't feel like you're losing out if you can't find resources. That's okay. A lot of people don't. Uh, do also un uh, develop your underlying skills. So like mental maths and writing essays. I'm horrible at mental maths if I don't have a piece of paper. Um, I mean, if I can write things down, I'm okay. But um, so this was an issue for me. So something I had to work on. Um, essay planning as well, you will write an essay. If you can't do it, get yourself good at it, okay? And also develop a time strategy. I mean, as you do practice questions, you'll know yourself. I cannot tell you which ones you can do faster or which ones you should do faster. It's really based on you and how you can answer questions. So develop it yourself. The more practice questions you do, the better you will get at this. And that's why you start early. Okay. Also do further reading for your essay. Uh, like BBC has their health website. Read journal articles, read um, books, medical books. These will be really important when you write your essay. You need to provide examples. Uh, treat BMAT revision as supplementary. So um, by that, I mean when you do revision for your BMAT. So when you're doing things like problem solving questions or developing your mental maths, don't see it as just for the BMAT, right? Because that will stress you out. Think of it rather as I'm doing this because it will help me in the future. It will, if you're into medicine, but it just so happens that these skills are also important for the BMAT. So don't focus too much on the fact that this is just for the BMAT. Um, these are important skills for later on as well. Just general advice to keep you calm. Don't stress out too much, especially if you're starting really early. You will get better at it. If you're really horrible uh, during your practice, that's really normal, actually, especially at the beginning. So don't worry too much. Also limit your practice to around 15 minutes a day. That's enough, uh, especially if you're starting early. Um, uh, unless you're doing a full paper, obviously, try and sit for the full two hours. but. Uh, otherwise, if you're just doing questions, uh, 15 minutes is good. Consider broadening your options as well. Don't just sit the BMAT if possible. Try and sit the UCAT as well, or try and consider other countries. Um, because if you do really badly in the BMAT, uh, that's kind of your medical school options over. You don't want that, do you? Um, and even if you don't get into medical school, that's okay. There are a bunch of other uh, things you could do, a bunch of other pathways as well. Um, so you know, do your research into those, but don't worry too much if you don't do too well on the BMAT. 
All right, that was a lot. So I'm just going to go through a quick recap. Uh, what is it? So what is the BMAT? It is an admissions test that helps universities decide between their students and which ones they want to accept. For the BMAT, you'll have three sections uh, that last two hours in total. Section one is like an IQ test. Section two is like an IGCSE paper. Um, and then section three is your essay writing. You're scored out of a maximum of 995A. And you should check with individual universities and their websites for how they actually use the scores. And my general advice is just have the right mindset for, um, for the test. Do start early and improve your underlying skills. If you do these, hopefully you have the best chance at the test. All right, thanks a lot. I'll be back for the ISAT, but for now I'll pass on. Oh, there was another interesting and insightful tip given. Thank you, Nicholas. Now I'll pass the floor back to Hamony, who will be talking about the IELTS. Although this is not a medical school admission test, it is actually one of the most common requirements for applying to any medical school. Hamony, you may begin. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. All right. Okay, so I'm back to talk to you about the IELTS examination. So what is the IELTS? Um, basically, it's, it's a test to um, designed to test the English language ability of candidates who want to or need to study um, in a country where English is used as the primary language of communication. So these countries are usually um, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, the US, and Canada. Um, so there are two types of IELTS tests. Um, most universities require you to take the academic IELTS test as it's slightly harder and it kind of um, tests you on things that you will need in university. There are other English proficiency tests that you can take and I've listed them down below. Um, but IELTS is usually recognized by most universities. Um, but that being said, um, you should check what is recognized by, by the university you want to apply to, um, just to be sure. Okay, so who needs to take the IELTS exam? Um, almost all Australian universities require international students to take an English proficiency test, like the IELTS. So there are no exemptions for students who have taken IGCSE English or um, SACE English as an additional language. On the other hand, uh, not all British universities require an external English test. Um, some recognize IGCSE English as a first language and therefore don't insist on you taking the IELTS. Um, but you are advised to check the requirements for each individual university. Um, but I recommend to be safe to take an English test like the IELTS because you might need it for things like visa, um, visa applications and things like that. So it's safe to just take one. And it, I think it's valid for three years, but I don't think you should quote me on that. Um, I, am only, I have only talked about Australian and British universities because I think um, that's where most of you are applying to. Um, so if you're applying to Canada, the US or New Zealand, you might want to check um, the country specific requirement. Okay, so how to sign up for the IELTS. Um, oops, okay, I hope you can hear, see it. Um, so how to sign up for the IELTS, you can sign up through the British Council as you're situated in Malaysia. And I'm pretty sure you can do this um, no matter what country you're in. Uh, I think you can sign up for either the paper-based test or the computer-based test, um, but note that the results of the paper-based test take longer to uh, uh, generate. Um, and the exams run almost every day. Okay, so the IELTS structure. Uh, so there are four main sections, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. Uh, so I've put here um, the, the length of each one, the number of sections within each section, and the number of questions. Um, so in terms of scoring, you will get a score between one and nine. 
craft scores such as 6.5 are possible as well. Um, different universities have different minimum requirements, so make sure to check the requirement um, for the course you're applying to uh, at university, um, because courses like medicine tend to have higher requirements than um, other courses. Okay, so listening. Um, this is the first section. Uh, it will take you about 30 minutes to do, well, you have 30 minutes to do it, and you've got 40 questions and four sections. Um, so the, the question types I have put um, below here, and I've also put the four sections on the recording. So you can see like the first one will probably be about conversation um, between people in an everyday context. So like ordering um, or booking like a restaurant or uh, buying tickets for a bus, things like that. Um, and the second one is sort of a monologue set in an everyday context again. Uh, the third section is usually a conversation between up to four people. And the fourth one is usually a monologue on an academic subject. Um, yeah, so you can refer to the question types on your own. And I will link a really good website that kind of goes through each question type that I don't have time to go through now. Um, and just note that the recordings um, played will be of native English, speaker, uh, English speakers. So you can expect to hear American, British, or even Australian people talking. So how to prep, at least what works for me. So for listening, I did um, just a few practice questions and papers um, that are available on the British Council website, and I will send the link for that later on. Um, apart from that, I think listening to podcasts and videos on academic topics um, can help you because when you listen to these things, you kind of familiarize yourself um, with slightly more advanced vocabulary and the style of people talking in those academic settings. So I recommend um, listening to those. You can see it on YouTube or, um, oh, sorry, you can listen to it on YouTube or Spotify, things like that. Okay, so next one we have is reading. Uh, so here you've got 60 minutes to do 40 questions and you have three passages. Um, and the types of passages you'll get will be extracts from things like books, journals, magazines, and newspapers. And again, um, here are the question types. I won't go over it. Um, I won't go over each type. Um, and I just want to say that if um, most of the questions are multiple choice, and if you have to write something, it probably won't be much. And they will probably write something like a uh, not more than three words, so you don't have to write too much because it's not the writing aspect anyway. Um, okay, so how to prep. Um, I recommend doing the practice questions and papers because you have a better understanding of what to expect um, uh, on the day and you just have a general idea about the, the, the structure and the format. Um, do just read books and newspaper articles. I think um, that's quite helpful uh, because it kind of helps you expand your vocabulary as well. Uh, practice speed reading. Uh, like I mentioned earlier for the UCAT uh, verbal reasoning section, um, since you don't have that much time, you might want to just practice grasping information quickly. And you can do this by just reading newspapers or magazines again. Read the instructions clearly and try and time yourself well. So you don't um, don't spend too much time on one question and not have enough time to uh, to do the other questions. Okay, so the writing section, I think this is by far the hardest part of the IELTS test to score in, and it's really subjective. Um, so basically, you've got two tasks: one is a short task, and one is a long writing task, and you have sixty minutes to do it. Uh, so in the first writing task, you may be asked to describe um, facts or figures in graphs or tables, and, or you might be given a diagram or a process of, of like a machine, and you might need to describe how it works. It should be an academic or semi-formal style, and you should include just the most important points um, that are relevant. Uh, some minor points can be left out. You shouldn't spend more than 20 minutes on this task as you only need to write about 150 words. And do note that you will be penalized if you don't write more than 150 words. Um, so just keep that in mind. 
but I don't think you um you won't be penalized if you write too many as well because 150 is just the minimum um, but you should not spend too long because the task one is not worth as much in terms of points as much as task two um, so task two is basically when you're given a topic to write about in an academic or again semi-formal style uh, for example um, you might be given like a topic such as an aspect on computers so you have to write an essay based on that um, and you should focus on writing on that aspect and not just a general essay about computers so you should spend about 40 minutes on this task and you need to write at least 250 words um, so yeah as i mentioned task two is worth um i think double the number of marks as task one so do spend more time on it so how to prep um, again you can do some practice questions and papers just to um, practice writing um, in timed conditions. Um, I don't think you can really get a gist of, I mean, like an idea of how, where you stand in terms of like what points you, number of points you get, because you can't really get these questions marked. Um, but it's just good to just practice writing. Uh, and do pay attention to grammar as you will be um, credited on those things. Uh, carefully read and analyze the information provided in task one um, because you just have to describe the information uh, based on what's given. I recommend you read some example essays and this website I have um, put in the size. I think it's a really good website uh, because it kind of shows you some example essays, model essays, and it kind of helps you understand the expected essay structure. Um, I think the website is really good. Many people I know who have taken the IELTS found it really helpful as well, including myself. So I do recommend using it. And it also kind of shows you the types of questions they can ask. Um, and to kind of get you in the higher bands, I think you should try and memorize or remember some trans transitional words, such as moreover, furthermore, additionally, those kind of things that can kind of help you get um, a higher score. And do, and there are many um, videos online about the writing class that you can watch. I've linked a few that I found quite helpful. Okay, so we've got speaking as the last section. Um, this one would be either physical. Okay, I'm not too sure if they still do that because of COVID. Um, or it might be through a Zoom call um, at the British Council, Council itself. So this usually lasts about 11 to 14 minutes. So there are three main parts. So the first part is basically general questions. The examiner will ask you general questions about yourself, your family, your work, your studies, and your interests. Um, really simple conversational things. And this lasts about four to five minutes. Part two is when you'll be given a card and you have um, to talk about a particular topic. So you have like a minute to prepare for this topic and then you have to speak for about two minutes or like at least up to two minutes. And in part three is when the examiner asks you questions about this particular topic. Um, this will give you the opportunity to discuss these ideas and issues uh, more in depth. And this lasts for about four to five minutes as well. So how to prep? Um, I recommend watching mock IELTS speaking tests online. And I've linked like a really good one, uh, like a really good YouTube channel that has quite a few. I think it's great to have like an idea of what to expect on that day by watching these. Pay attention to pronunciation. I think it helps. Um, I think if you do pronounce things properly or the correct way, um, then you would get more um, marks. Um, and don't worry too much about the accuracy of the content you provide, um, because this test is not testing your um, your accurate the accuracy of your content. They're just testing your English language speaking ability. So if you say you have five brothers when you only have two, um, it's not a big deal. They're not going to penalize you for inaccurate information. Uh, but that being said, don't say um, really absurd uh, things. Um, I think just listening to people speak on podcasts, videos, and on the TV will just help you um, develop a better speaking manner as well. And you can practice just talking to yourself, your family, or your friends. Uh, you don't necessarily have to practice these IELTS questions, but just um, practice talking to them about issues. I think it will help. 
And lastly, I've got some useful resources. Um, I didn't spend any money on the um, the IELTS test. I just used, there are many, there are really lots of free um, resources. So the British Council um, gives out free tests that you can do. And it also has lots of guides about the IELTS test to get a better understanding about it. And there are also many YouTube channels. I've listed a few of the ones I watched before doing the test. And I found those really helpful because it helps you. It goes through, they go through lots of different aspects of the IELTS test and how to score in them. So I think it's good to have a look at them. Yeah, so that's all I have for the, I, the IELTS test. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Haymini. I've definitely learned a lot from your presentation. Last but not least, let me re-invite Nicholas to talk about the ISAT, which is the most common admissions test for students applying to medical school in Australia. Nick, you may begin. Okay, so uh, hi again. Just before I begin, I will keep this shorter because I know we're short on time and there are a few questions I can see in the slider. So, um, but a lot of my advice is very similar anyway. A lot of these tests are similar in nature. So, uh, uh, just the same disclaimer again, that the information I'm sharing is accurate as of right now. And if you want more details or I'd say better information, uh, check official websites. Okay, I'll go through the same things in introduction of the test, the sections involved, uh, the scoring of the test, as well as any advice that I have for you. Okay, uh, I'm the same person, but uh, just so you know, I took the ISAT in May of this year, and I do also have my score for that. Okay, um, so it's a non-calculator computer test, uh, the ISAT, and it gauges, again, the abilities of high-performing international students. That's important there because ISAT stands for International Student Admissions Test. So this applies to international students uh, only. Um, just again, to, to give you an example of the competitive nature of medicine, in Australia, 1,600 students applied to the Un University of New South Wales, UNSW, for medicine, and about 250 got a place. Uh, so that's about a 15% chance, and this is overall, I'm pretty sure for international students, it's slightly more competitive. Um, so yeah. And again, used alongside other things like your predicted grades, uh, any written components, uh, things like that. This one is developed by the Acer, so check their website. Uh, ISAT itself has a website that I'll show you there. Um, so you can refer to both resources. Uh, it's usually for undergraduate medical courses in Australia. If you know what that means, good on you. If you don't know what that means, it's okay. Again, check the websites. This is why it's important. Um, uh, Australia is kind of transitioning out of the undergraduate pathway, so stay vigilant for what different universities will look for. Currently, this is the list of universities that accept the ISAT. Very limited, as you can see. Monash, UNSW, Queensland, Tasmania, UWA, and WSU. That's it. And there are so many medical schools in the country. These are the only ones that accept it. Uh, and the list, um, if I were to predict correctly, will only get shorter. Okay, so the sections for the ISAT are actually quite simple. Uh, first is your critical reasoning. Uh, these are your wordy kind of questions. And then your quantitative reasoning. So that is your uh, math C questions. You will have three hours to do 100 questions. And so that's about a minute 45 per question. Uh, there is no distinction between the two sections that I showed you here. So unlike with say the BMAT or the UCAT where you kind of finish one and then move on to another, um, it's kind of like the questions are mixed in. So you, it's like the sections aren't separated basically and you get 50 of each. Uh, so it's equally split. Just for the record, I mean, I'm not trying to scare you, obviously, but it's definitely harder than the UCAT and BMAT. I took the BMAT uh, and I found the ISAT harder. Hemini took the UCAT as well, and she also found the ISAT harder. Uh, so we kind of collectively agree the ISAT was a harder test. Again, not to scare you, it's mainly due to the fact that it's three hours long. It, it's a whole hour extra, which is quite a lot. Um, and the questions are long, which I will show you here. So this is an example of a wordy question. Um, 
again, we don't have time to go through them, but uh, just so you can see. And then here's an example of a maths equation. Okay, again, the important thing for all of these tests would be your results, right? So you will get a scaled score from 100 to 200. Why not zero to 100? I, you know, I don't know, but 100 to 100 does the job. It's based on correct answers and difficulty, unlike the BMAT that I talked about just now, where it's just based on the mark. ISAT is not like that. It's not only the correct answers, but how difficult they are. So in other words, if it's a more difficult question, you get more points. If it's an easy question, you know, everyone can get it right. It's maybe worth like one extra point. So that's how they do it. That's what it means, uh, a scaled score. So it does really depend on how others who do the test do as well. Um, now you will get um, a score for each section. So your critical as well as your quantitative reasoning. And you will also get an average, uh, sorry, you will get an overall score, which is just an average of those two. Um, and then you'll be given a percentile for, for all three. So for your critical, quantitative, as well as overall. Um, so this, uh, oops, what have I done? Okay, there you go. So uh, this is just an example of a score that you can see here. It's my score. I know some of you are asking. Uh, so uh, th this was mine. Um, now, full score would be 200, 200, 200 as the number, and then obviously 100th, 100th, 100th percentile um, for, for all of them. I can't tell you what's good because uh, these guys are quite good at hiding the statistics, unlike BMAT and UCAT. Uh, those guys publish a lot more. Um, but I will say, try and get above 170 as well as 75th percentile. It just maximizes your options because of the different cutoffs and things like that, the minimum scores for all of the universities. So based on my research, if you get 170 and 75th percentile, you should be eligible for all possible courses that I showed you from the list just now. Um, so again, different universities use it differently. I won't go through this, but uh, you can... Uh, you know, look at it yourself. My advice is also really similar. Mm. Firstly, do start early, all right? Uh, and do it alongside your other test practice. So if you're doing, say, the BMAT as well as the ISAT, you can use the same resources. In fact, that's one of my recommendations for you um, because ISAT charges a lot for the resources. I think it was like $20 for 50 questions. It's ridiculous and it's not worth it in my opinion do BMAT or UCAT questions, and then um, the, the underlying skills are, are the same. Um, one thing I will point out is that I did say the ISAT is a harder test. So, um, you know, the official question guide does contain more difficult questions. You might want to take that into consideration if you don't buy the guide. All right. Um, but what I'm saying is you could probably do really well with just using UCAT and BMAT revision as well. Again, your underlying skills are important. So mental maths, you have no calculator. And then speed reading. I said questions are very long, so speed reading is good. Uh, and then, like I explained just now with the BMAT, see your practice more as supplementary. Don't kind of focus on it as being uh, just for the ISAT and then stressing yourself out. Uh, and then mentally, don't stress if you're starting early as well. If you're not doing so well at the start, that's totally normal. Um, you'll get better the more you practice. Also limit your practice time to around 15 minutes a day. Now, I will say uh, it's hard to do full papers for the ISAT because I never had three hours to do a full test. I never did a practice test. So I used to do 15 minute question blocks. Um, again, ISAT makes it very hard to access resources. So a lot of people enter the test quite blindly. If you feel that way, that's okay. Like, don't worry about that. Just know that you're not alone. Uh, and again, consider broadening your options. Don't just fixate yourself on a few universities uh, in case your ISAT score it maybe isn't so good. And even if you don't get into medical school, that's okay. A lot of things that you could do. Um, okay, so just recapping. What is the ISAT? It is an admissions test that helps universities decide when choosing the students they want to accept. For the ISAT, you have two question types. They're not really separate sections, just you know, question types. Critical reasoning, which are your word questions, and then your quantitative reasoning, which are the kind of maths questions. 
You're scored from 100 to 200, both for each section and then overall. You will also be given percentiles for all three categories. And my advice would be have the right mindset, do start as early as possible, and improve the underlying skills that are important for the test. Okay. Yeah, sorry, that was a bit fast, but I mean, a lot of it was quite similar to the other tests as well. Thank you so much to our guest speakers for this enlightening session. We hope everyone also find this session helpful for your upcoming admission test. We will now begin the Q&A session. Everyone can type your question in the slider with link given in the chat box. So let's see what we have. The first question is directed to Nicholas. Can you share your BMAT scores? Okay, actually, I showed you the sample just now. Anyway. No, that was my score. So this was my score. Uh, this was my official set of results. Um, if you're curious, it got, oops, oops, it got me an Oxford percentage of 67. Uh, oh, I mean, I don't know what that will do for me because um, I literally got the score yesterday. Eh, yeah, yesterday. So I, I don't know if I'll get in or not. But um, yeah, don't, don't bet on it. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Okay, so for the second question, um, it's not like directed to anyone, but on a scale of one to ten, how hard was the test for like Nick and Hemini? Can maybe share about your UCAT and ISAT and DMAT? Okay, so I'll go first then. Um, so for the UCAT, I think I found it solid seven but I think if you had done if I had done more practice I feel like I would have found it a bit easier uh so I think practice will help um for the ISA I think I would give that a solid 9.5 because it was just really hard as I didn't have much as we don't have much resources and I went in very blind, blindly as Nick said uh yeah so I think that's it yeah, okay. I'd say for me, I said, yeah, definitely. I, I, you know, I'd, I'll say 10 just because it was really that difficult. Uh, BMAT, uh, I'll give it a five, six. It wasn't, it wasn't that difficult, to be honest. Um, if I had prepared more, I think I could have gone better, but oh well. To me, which language center can I sit for the physical BMAT test? Uh, so it, it depends. For this year, for example, as long as you were not in Singapore or Thailand, you did it as a computer test. If you were in Singapore and Thailand, you did it physically. Uh, I, I don't really know why. Um, you can't choose. Okay. The next question is directed to, I guess, Hemani. What is a good UCAT score? Okay, I think it's quite difficult to say what a good UCAT score is because each university has their own different cutoff point. Um, but I think the average score is about 2680. So I think generally, if you get higher than that, it's um, already quite decent. But it's not like a guarantee you'll get into any university, obviously. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And to Hemani again, is UCAT required for Malaysian universities? Um, to my knowledge, it's not. Uh, but I mean, do check with the university specifically. Um, just to be sure. If I could just chip in really quickly, uh, the BMAT is required for the University of Malaya, in case you were curious. So, um, yeah. Thank you. To Nicholas, how long do you take to prepare your exam? Uh, well, if you're talking about the IELTS, I took three days. Oh, that's all I did. Uh, <laughs> for the BMAT, it was like two and a half months, I think. Uh, but that's why I, I think if I had done more, then I would have done better. So that's why I emphasize that quite a bit. For the ISAT, oh, God, like a month, maybe? That was a mistake, but uh, could have done better again. Um, not the worst. Yeah. Okay, um, so Haveni, when did you take your UCAT? I sat for my UCAT exam in August of this year. The next question is directed to Hanny again. Are all UK questions equal mark? Yeah, I think they're all equal mark. I don't think 
um, they scaled or anything. So um, yeah, especially so if you get stuck in one question, you shouldn't worry too much because mm -hmm. the other question will be what the same amount. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Okay, um, this is directed to Hemini again. Uh, can I receive? Can they receive the UCAT if they fail? Yeah, I don't think you can fail the UCAT. Um, there's no fail mark. You can just not get into university, I think. Um, but you can reset it, but just not in the same year. You have to set, uh, reset the next year, I think. The next question is, what do I need to bring when I go for my UCAT exam? Okay. Um, I think when you sign up for your UCAT exam, they'll send you an email with everything you need to bring. Uh, you don't have to bring any equipment, so you don't need to bring a whiteboard or pen or anything. You will have to use the computer and the keyboard and the mouse and the whiteboard given to you uh, at your exam centre. I think you need to bring things like your IC or your passport, um, those kind of things, but you will be notified on what to bring. Thank you. All right, um, to Hemini again, uh, what is your IL score? Okay. Um, so my overall score was 8.5 out of 9. And then the for each component, uh, okay, I, I can't really remember. Give me one second. Okay, so for listening, I got 9, reading 8.5, writing 7, and speaking 9. Wow, that was impressive. Thank you. So Nick, why is I said harder? Uh, okay, it's an hour longer, so that's a lot. Uh, it is, the questions are also longer. Mm, if it's a worded question, there's a lot more text to read. If it's a math question, there's a lot of math that you actually have to do. Um, so it's mm, more time pressured and it gets tiring after a while, but you can't stop because it's, you know, you fail. <laughs> How long did I prefer? I think I answered that about, about a month, maybe. So um, I think both of you can answer this. When is the good timing to take the admissions test? So I suppose this person is taking A-level. So could you give some advice? Okay, I'll go first then. Uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, there are testing cycles for the UCAT. And I think the ISAT as well, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so you have to sit it in those um, in that time. I think for A levels, you should do it um, the year you the year before or the year you start applying. Um, so if you're you're going into university next September, then you should have done it this year. Yeah. If you're taking the BMAT, you have one option. That's November of the year before you apply. Uh, sorry, the year before you start at uni. Um, they don't give you any choice. If that happens during your A-level, that's really too bad. They, they don't care. Um, yeah. Thank you. To Harmony, how many times can I sit for IL in a year? Uh, I don't think there's any limit. You can sit it um, every day if you want, but um, yeah, there's no limit. Thank you. Okay, the last question to Nicholas. How long would my VMAT score be will, will be valid after taking it? Um, uh, I'm not sure how to, so it depends on the uni. Uh, for most UK universities, it's not valid after that. So you have one shot at it. If you fail, you either apply the next year or you deal with it. For the case of like UM, I think you can use any result from 12 months before you apply. Um, that's to my knowledge. I would check with the universities. Mm. Okay, I think that's all for the questions. So, okay, I think that is all the time we have for today. Once again, I would like to thank our guest speakers for this talk and also thank our exco beauty members at home for organizing this wonderful event. We would also like to thank the participants for spending their precious Saturday night with us and we we hope that you've learned something through this talk. So before we dismiss, let's take a group picture for our memories of this event. Yes. Um, um, Sarah, 
Don't be shy. Okay, uh, three, two, one. We're done. All right, thank you. Um, Jawan? Finally, we will be grateful if everyone can fill in the feedback form that will be shared in the chat box to improve our future event. Thank you in advance for your honest feedback. We will also share the QR code for the feedback form. Next, remember to check out our Instagram and Facebook page, which we'll leave in the chat box. If you have fun in this event, you can share on social media and tag us too. Once again, thank you so much and good night.